So, hey, thanks for being here. The, you know, the perpetual studency of the automotive aftermarket. They come here, uh, if not Friday Live, they watch uh, the repeat on the weekend, and then they watch the repurposed uh, video or podcast that comes out next Wednesday, which this one will be. We're here to talk about the impact of the new tax law. Uh, did you know that there was a new tax law? Of course you did. You remembered all the stuff they talked about earlier in the year. That political football, it was a football game, think Jerry, or I think Reed or Hunt. You guys are football people. And, and you're here to help us, help us learn, uh, learn about that. Anyway, uh, glad, glad you're here. I want to I thank Jasper Engines and Repair Pail for bringing the Town Hall Academy to the industry free each and every week. You know, a family keeps their vehicle an average of 11 years. Now, where's the first place to turn when the drivetrain fails? Why? Jasper. An engine or transmission is a major purchase and it should be trusted to a 100% associate owned company for quality remanufactured products. Thank you, Jasper, for supporting the Town Hall Academy. And after 10 plus years in business, Repair Pail has become the nation's largest network of independent auto repair shops. Their certification program ensures that customers who go to Repair Pail certified shops will receive quality, trustworthy repairs. Thank you, guys. Hey, um, wow, the new impact of the new tax laws. We happen to have two extremely um, qualified, more than I think anyone else in the industry, to talk about this. Reed Mellis, financial therapist. God, Reed, I love that. I mean, that is just so perfect because most of your clients probably need some therapy. Absolutely. We want to talk them from jumping off the edge. <laughs> so we want to keep them on, uh, up on the ledge instead of jumping off of it. That's good. That's good. He's a partner at Parr Mellis and Associates in Mount Airy, Maryland. Hunt Demarest is also with us in the same office. CPA at Parr Mellis and Associates. Thanks for being here, Hunt. Thanks for having us. And shop owner Jerry Frank. And business coach at Repair Shop Coach. Uh, Jerry, thanks for jumping on so quickly with this. I think uh, I, what I heard about you is that you are a frustrated accountant. <laughs> kind of, kind of. <laughs> I guess I'm a numbers guy at heart, but been doing it a long time. So thanks for having me, Carmen. Uh, I'm glad you're here because I think you're going to help us bring some perspective to what Hunt and Reed are going are to bring to us. Listen, I'm not an accountant, so I'm going to ask you guys to start from a perspective of a shop owner, guys, and I know that's one of your areas of expertise. Let's start about, um, you know, your first talking point, a new 20% deduction for qualified small business income. Does that mean it's going down? That means it's going down. In fact, that means that uh, if you make $100,000 of profit and if you happen to be a sole proprietor, a partnership, or an S corporation, you only have to pay taxes on $80,000 of it. So 20% of your profits are not subject to federal and income taxes. Could be subject to state, but not on federal income taxes. So that is a big, big plus for all small business owners if they are a sole proprietor, partnership, or an S corporation. The one that's excluded from this is if you happen to be a C corporation. So if, and most uh, shop owners are, most of them are S corporations, sole proprietors, one member LLCs, or their partnerships. In fact, uh, across the United States, three, I'm sorry, 34 million tax returns will qualify for this deduction. Wow. Well, that's a big number. I, I would bet you that uh, the majority of the service professional is going to fall there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, just to give you an idea, the tax savings by having this deduction, uh, we have clients that making over $60,000 more profit this year than last year, and will pay about $23,000 less in taxes because of this. Um, that's and exciting. And we're sharing hear. less with our business partner, Uncle Sam. Yeah, that's, that's exciting to hear. Now, uh, Jerry, if that was your fortune, uh, and it probably will be next year, is it, does it allow you to invest in equipment, to, uh, consider growing? I mean, what, what, what would an owner think about what to do with the money he didn't have to give Uncle Sam? Yeah, boy, a lot of, a lot of different things, you know, uh, I guess maybe I'd first start off with if this is new to you, you know, you should be having these conversations with your accountant or tax professional on a, on a regular basis. Uh, it shouldn't be new. But, uh, you know, as the year comes to close, there's a lot of 
cool things on the horizon and you know what that means uh you know you really want to sit down and have a one-to-one -one. i'm not accountant i don't play one on tv that's why we rely on the professionals like like reed but yeah you got to get your ducks in a row here before the year ends excellent now let me ask all of you a question if i realize i was coming into money <laughs> and that's probably not the right thing to say but i had a lot less of a tax base would i take some of that uh, money that i wouldn't have given uncle sam and pay down debt yeah i mean that's one of the things that we talk about when we go through this is even though this is new this year it's still going to be around for at least another five years but it's not going to feel like new money after this year it's going to become the new normal that you're used to um, so one of the big things that we talk about is you know, what you decide to do with that money this year is really important because it's going to kind of set the stage that, you know, for what you have in future years. Um, one of the big things that we talk about is we talk about to a lot of shop owners about retirement and all too many times shop owners say, this is my retirement, right? I'm not putting money into a simple, I'm not putting into a 401k, I'm going to sell my business. Um, what this is getting, like Reed just talked about, you know, $24,000, a husband and wife can get, both max out their IRAs with that $24,000. Now you've set yourself up and you've set your money up that you're going to be maxing out for subsequent years to come. Um, but you're exactly right. I mean, it's, you have to decide what you're going to do now because, you know, a couple of years down the road, it's going to be like, hey, you know, this is just what we've all used to. You bring up, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, as you said, with the windfall of money, you do have some choices. Paying down debt is not a bad idea. We would also say set some aside for a rainy day. Unfortunately, shop owners don't plan enough to keep enough cash aside for stuff happening. So save for a rainy day, retirement, paying down debt, absolutely great ideas. Which is the reason to have professionals working for you in the form of attorneys, accountants, and other financial planners. I love the idea of putting money away for retirement. Okay, everyone in the audience, raise your hand if you've saved enough. Hmm. I didn't see any hands go up <laughs> and you weren't the audience I was talking about. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's important to, you know, and, and to, to your point, I have to tell you, Hunt, when I, when I mentioned that pay down debt, I did not think of the fact that this year would be a windfall and the rest of the year years would become the new normal. I never thought of that. So I guess there's some, a big decision to make here. Yeah. And I think we got a question coming in. It says 80% of any amount or profit. Um, so it's actually a 20% deduction. So if you make a hundred thousand dollars, you only have to pay tax on 80% of that because of that 20% deduction. And that's going to be profits, not sales. So, if, you know, your business, let's stretch that out. For example, what if it was $200,000, then it would be on 40,000 less. Correct. That's correct. Okay. So I think we're answering Tom Ham's uh, question with that. Can, uh, I want to add one more point. I, we mentioned the concept of the idea for small businesses, sole proprietors, partnerships, S corporations. It's also if you self rent to your own shop, 20% of that we don't pay taxes on either. Okay, so self rental also qualifies for this tax savings. Are uh, shop owners excited about this? Well, <laughs> I think they should be. Um, I know uh, I got a little confession to make that uh, uh, Reed is also my accountant, so to be in the truth. But, you know, we have those conversations, like we talk those critical conversations. And uh, I think it gets a little bit better. Um, I know I, I had heard that, uh, uh, and not heard, it's a fact, you know, 100% uh, of your purchases or asset purchases are uh, can be deductible versus um, you know, expensing that out or depreciating that out. So, uh, you know, it's really a win-win this year for the shop owner. Uh, you had mentioned putting money away. I think I read some statistic recently that, you know, the average, the average small business could be out of, you know, they only have enough money to really pay off a few weeks if things don't go right. You know, I've been in business a long time where, you know, I can remember where they closed the road in front of me for construction. You know, and it was really difficult to get in, in and out of your shop. So putting together that little nest egg, if you will, to prepare for the hard times is really important. So that was a great point. That's a great point. I want to go back to this 100% deduction thing, guys. Let's talk about that. 
So one of the big things that we see in the, in the past when we talk to our clients and said, hey, you are looking at a sizable balance due at the end of the year. Um, what we heard a lot of times is, hey, I'd like to, you know, redo my parking lot. My building is kind of aging. I, you know, want to kind of take it into the 21st century. And so, you know, we're talking about 50, maybe even $100,000 remodels. Um, but unfortunately, we would say, you know what, that's good to spend for your business. But under the old tax laws, you're getting no deduction for that this year. Most of the time, we're depreciating over 39 years. So once I tell them that, they say, well, not only am I going to be out fifty dollars to $100,000 in cash, I'm not going to get any benefit for it this year. And, you know, a lot of shop owners are saying, you know what, maybe let's hold off on that. So one of the big things that we're excited about is, you know, expanding this to include improvements and repairs to buildings. Um, because it's going to let a lot of shop owners do stuff that they've always wanted to do. And now they can truly take the benefit of that. Um, you know, like Jerry was saying, we also able to write off up to a million dollars in assets this year, you know, whether that's equipment, um, heavy trucks and stuff like that. We don't see that affecting a lot of shop owners because it used to be half a million dollars. Um, we only have a handful of people that are buying more than that. Some of the big tow guys, you know, if you buy a couple of trucks, you know, if, if you really want to, you can be able to write all that off in one year. Wait a minute. Are you talking about writing off an old asset or are you talking about depreciating it? Depreciating and writing off are usually generally one and the same. Mm -hmm. So when the, the accounting term is depreciating, the layman's term is writing it off. Got right? it. So uh, if we, we, in the past, where the old law says we could write off or depreciate all in one year, a half a million dollars, it did bump up to a million. We're not all that excited about that, that concept of moving up to a million because it doesn't affect most of our small repair shop owners. But the plus is, as Hunt was saying, we now get to improve, write off improvements, okay? Such as if you do want to put a new roof, want to pave the parking lot, those things we have to, we had to usually write off or depreciate over 39 years. Now we're getting it today. I've seen an awful lot of shop owners show on Facebook their beautiful new showrooms. Yeah. Yes. And, and so that is 100% deductible. If you would like to, yes. If you would like to. Now, a question. So it's not, it's, it, it, it's a depreciated expense. Is that what you're saying, guys? Correct. So you have your choice, either depreciating, a, depreciating it over time or taking it all today. Got it. And, okay. and, and it, it, does our industry understand that depreciation is a non-cash expense? No, no. And so that's one of the big things that comes up is some of these times we have people that are getting you know, 10 or 15 year loans to, uh, to help finance these large improvements. And they want to write off all of the amount this year. But what they don't realize is if you have this 10 or 15 year loan, you're not going to have any expenses to offset those payments that you have to be making for the next 10 to 15 years. If you take all that depreciation this year. And so one of the big things is if you're paying this all with cash, fine, the cash is out. Let's make the expense or the depreciation match that outlay. But if you have a loan, then you know you might have to weigh that thing. Does it make sense to pay a little bit of tax now so that I have the deduction in the future? Um, you know, it's kind of trying to put off that instant gratification of getting all the write-off right now today. Got it, Jerry. Anything instant, to help yeah, well, I want instant instant return. You know, exactly. and we all want that. I know yeah. for for years, you know. Uh, uh, improvements, simple things. So we had a conversation about the parking lot at my shop. You know, for years I've been, uh, you know, sealing it and filling up those potholes. I'm from Cleveland, so we have that really tough winters come in and really tears up the pavement. And this year it made sense rather than putting a couple thousand dollars and making it look pretty, let's just replace the parking lot, which uh, was a little over $20,000. And uh, the way I look at that is Uncle Sam, my business partner, and Reed, you alluded to that, Uncle Sam kind of picked up the tab for 30 plus percent of that parking lot. So it made sense to do it rather than taking a little piece of that, being able to claim a small portion of that over a huge number of years. So yeah. Guys, really well. do the math on that 30% for us. Explain that. Is it because that your tax rate was 30%? Is that sure, right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. So it's like, you know, Uncle Sam on a $20,000 parking lot, he's going to pay $6,000 of that parking lot for me. Really nice. Wow. This was great. Thank you, guys. Uh, what a great kickoff. Now, number two, expanded child independent tax credits. 
Okay, with the, uh, that, uh, I'm very excited about that because the tax law in the past allowed us a $1,000 uh, tax credit for each of our children that were under the age of 17, all right? The new law says if they're under the age of 17, it's now $2,000, all right? So it moves from one to $2,000. That's good, but here's where it gets better. They widen the income that you could earn to qualify. A lot of times our clients, if they made uh, over $110,000 in 2017, got a zero tax credit. Now, if they make over uh, up to $400,000 as a married couple, they get the $2,000 tax credit. So that's really exciting is we end up getting a lot larger credit for more people. All right? Basically, they moved up the, the, the level, the high income bracket. Absolutely, from 110 to 400. So that's a lot of people that now qualify for it. And they add a new credit. Okay, so the old credit was for 17 and under. Now they added a new credit for people that are 18 and over. Okay, and it's a $500 credit. It's not as big, but hey, at least now the kids in college, you get a $500 credit where in the past we got zero. All right, so that's a good thing. Or if your parents are your dependents, you get a $500 credit for them. If you have a nephew that's living in a house that's a slug and does nothing, you get a $500 credit for that nephew as well. So they expanded more chances to give you free money. Let's explain something that's really important here. A tax credit is better than a tax deduction. A credit is just like the government gave you cash. A deduction reduces the income. So the more credits you could get, it's just like Uncle Sam paying for the taxes. Hunt, you want to share your example of your one client? Yeah, and so one of my clients in the past, he has six kids. Um, he made about $200,000, $225,000. And, you know, everyone jokes about having kids and be like, oh, you know, it's a write-off. Um, but as Reed showed, if you're over $110,000, you were getting no credit. Most people didn't even realize that they weren't getting that child tax credit. Um, but this client, he's going to get a $12,000 tax savings this year just from the kids alone. I mean, that's one of the ones, you know, it's us. Go ahead. Reed, you said tax credit is cash. So yes. if he's got six kids times 2000, that's $12,000 coming off of his tax liability. Yes. yes. Not reducing his income, but coming off his tax liability. Yeah. Wow. That's and, huge. And a lot of that could be refunded as well. So if he has a tax liability of $10,000, he gets the credit that wipes out that liability and he gets some money back. Free money. Well, it's already worth it to have listened to this show today. I mean, <laughs> my God, guys. <laughs> you guys, it's like here, I got bushels of cash. To get. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it was, it was our, I guess, our Congress that did this, right? Yes. How do, you, how do you see this, Jerry, as far as, I mean, are we telling our employees all this good stuff that's going on? That's exactly what I was thinking because, you know, uh, part, of our, part of our duty really as a shop owner is to kind of up-level our employees, right? So you need to try to share this stuff with, uh, with your employees because uh, usually they don't have the, uh, the benefits that we do as shop owners, sitting down with professionals, talking to great folks like, uh, read and hunt to kind of give them the inside scoop. But I think the most people really have no idea some of the benefits that, uh, that, that they can deserve here uh, or are entitled to in uh, 2018 as it comes to a close. I would assume, guys, in your accounting firm that you've duly reached out to all of your clients and said, hey, you know, here's our newsletter. This is what you need to be prepared with. Um, and, and if not, I mean, you did. But anyone who's listening that doesn't have a good accounting firm or hasn't been briefed, if you will, on all the things that are going on in 2018, get it done, reach out, do it, find a, a new accounting firm and, you know, use this, use this show to, to move you over the line. That's a really good point, Carm, because uh, I've been in the business now uh, longer, longer than I care to mention, probably 35 plus years. Uh, and uh, for many years early on in business, I didn't have that 
uh, power team, if you will, those accountants to sit down with to help me with those decisions. Uh, listen, if the best advice I can give you, if you're not getting that important information from your accountant, uh, early on in my career, I think my uh, accountant was working for the IRS. I would only see him at tax time and he would say, here's what you owe, you know, and, you, and then panic sets in. So you need to sit down with, with your accountant and uh, do some tax planning. He'll inform you of what's new. Do some forecasting. Uh, you know, take advantage of uh, the so-called loopholes, if you will. But that's what an accountant should really be giving you. Tax advice, not a tax bill. I love what you say, your power team. And uh, I know it's accountant. I know it's a, an attorney, but it's also a banker, right, Jerry? Yeah, for sure. Uh, when we decided to move locations some many years ago, I had a, you know, I felt I was in good standing with the bank and all of that. And guess what? I went to the bank and they said no. And it really uh, kind of uh, opened my eyes up. Uh, now I have relationships with several bankers. So, uh, you know, I feel like you're in a really good position. So yeah, you, everybody needs to have a great banker, great accountant, and, uh, and a great uh, an attorney as well. Thanks, guys. We're, we're going we're gonna to move back into uh, uh, Hunt and Reed's number three most important things we have to worry about. But first, when your customer's vehicle engine or transmission fails, it's not the end of the road. See, a remanufactured drivetrain product from Jasper Engines and Transmissions will give your customers a new lease on life. Go to jasperengines.com for more information. And want to become Repair Pal certified? Well, you'll need a minimum of a 1212 warranty, a shop management system, a high customer satisfaction score, and recent tech training. Learn about free tech training from repairpal.com slash shops. Uh, <clears throat> I'm thrilled. I had no idea how uh, this was going to come out, and we're, we're 20 some minutes in, and you guys are hitting a home run. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Hunt, uh, read number three, expanded section 179 and bonus depreciation rules now that sounds really accounting <laughs> <laughs> well we actually kind of talked a lot about that already when we talked about writing off equipment uh and or leasehold improvements so we really kind of hit that a little early on we actually jumped from uh, uh one right into three if, if you want to be right. honest yeah uh, I would like to dovetail back a little bit to a comment uh, Jerry made uh, mention about educating your team members mm -hmm. uh, on tax law changes. All the technicians that used to write off their equipment or tools and their uniforms and stuff like that will not be able to do that this year. So the new tax law eliminated employee business expenses. So here's an opportunity to teach uh, your technicians that the write-off of their old tools or the tools that they were buying are not a benefit for them. This is now an opportunity for a business owner to think of a way to take care of their technicians and maybe reimbursing them a little bit more for their tools in lieu of maybe raises per se. So that way, because the employee can't write it off, but the business still could write off those tools. Are you get, Am I making some sense there? Yeah, you're making all kinds of sense. We've had dialogues on this show and on the podcasts about buying technicians' tools and, you know, building the kind of equipment base in the shop that prevents, you know, your guy spending all the time on the tool truck and let it kind of, if you will, be a retention piece. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you've got all those tools. So if he's, if he's spending 200 bucks, uh, I don't know, a week, a month or whatever uh, on, on the tool truck, you're saying on his personal income tax, he can't deduct that. He can't deduct that. Yeah. In the old law, he could, but now he can't. So any employee business related expense that they have, if they were paying their uh, home internet because they were doing researches and stuff like that and working on uh, getting certified and stuff like that, that is all gone. What so, was the, uh, what's the reasoning for, for all of that? You got any idea why that was taken away? Um, it was honestly an extremely abused area of people's taxes. You know, just as likely as someone to deduct, you know, legitimate expenses for tools and uniforms, we had people that just kind of went a bit overboard with it. Um, so that I think is one side of it. And I believe another side is to also push some of this back onto the businesses saying, hey, if you're going to require this person to come here and do the job, you're actually pushing the cost of doing his job onto them. 
And so maybe a bit of pushback to try and get the corporations or the business owners to, you know, start picking up some of that tab. What a great opportunity, though, for your technicians as a shop owner. Now you can actually purchase their tools. If I understand you correctly, guys, we can purchase their tools, give them a great spiff, right? Something that nobody else is doing, and we get to write it off. So, you know, think about the benefits of that. You know, uh, you're going to have a technician that's going to stay with you because I don't think, you know, I got to say most of the shops up and down the street aren't aware of this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, think about how that in, in today's, uh, today's really tough economy when uh, we all know the technician shortages and things that out there, it's just one more feather you can put on your hat that might make a, you know, a, a technician choose you instead of the competition. So how many techs knew that they could deduct their tool purchases? In the past, I would say a lot of them knew they could deduct it in the past. Um, We've been fortunate with our, our practice. Uh, we've done a lot of tax returns for uh, employees of our clients, uh, as well as employees to dealerships mm -hmm. along the way, and they were all writing those items off. Uh, and when we did, when we did their tax return this year, we showed them their tax return without that happening. So all of our clients were pre-educated along the way. Um, and by the way, just to jump back on also something Jerry talked about is tax planning. April 15th is not the day to do tax planning, just so everybody knows that. <laughs> the best time probably is in September, October, when the accountants are a little less busy and we can stay focused on, on your conversation and your business a little bit more. Just for a word to the wise. Wow, Jerry, he brings up such an important idea. How many shop owners out there are sitting down with their professional accounting team saying, okay, let's plan uh, what's going on this year. What I mean, do I, can I still do something that will have a positive tax implication for me yet for the rest of the year? Yeah, and that's why it's so, so important, Carm. Um, you know, usually you get hit with that surprise, right? At In, in April or maybe a little bit before then. And then, uh, you know, most people don't put aside that money. They're faced panic on their face and all of that. It shouldn't be a surprise. Well, that's you know, the surprise. Planning for it all year. You told me I made money. There's no cash in the bank. You told me I have to pay taxes. There's no cash in the bank. How could I pay taxes when I don't have any money? Yeah, where did it go? You know, exactly. And that's right. one of the things you really need yeah. to partner with. Where did I go? And, and I do want to talk, uh, you know, I want to do talk about that with you uh, at the end, Jerry, about uh, the Profit First book, okay? Sure. We'll talk about that. Um, number four, hey guys, thanks. That was great. Uh, I think we may have opened a whole lot of minds with, with, the, uh, with the, the technician piece. And, and, and by the way, Jerry, I love your idea. What an opportunity for the shop owner to do something for his people and, and do it for all the right reasons. Maybe this is the move that will take this new business model, tool buying model uh, to the next level. Um, guys, number four on your list was new lower tax rates and tax brackets. Um, sounds like the summary of everything that's going on. Yeah, and so one of the things that we heard a lot or like depending on which news station you're listening to is that this was a tax break only for the rich, right? You know, that no one was affected. Yeah. Um, you know, while that is true, the top tax rate went from almost 40% down to 37%, so almost a 3% decrease, but we're seeing a roughly a 3% decrease across most brackets. Um, so really every income level we're seeing decreases. One of the biggest changes though, is not only did they change the uh, amount of tax in those brackets, they expanded some of those. Um, so in the past, if you were making over $230,000, you would have already been up in the 33% tax bracket. Now that same tax bracket or that same area of income is 24% and it goes up to $300,000. So you can see how not only are the actual rates lowered, these buckets are getting bigger. So kind of the sweet spot where we see a lot of business owners falling is it takes a lot more to get into those higher tax brackets. The word rich is such a relative term. I mean, somebody having a double income family making $250,000 is, you know, it, it's there, but it, it doesn't mean that they're rich. They're mm -hmm. actually spending every dime they make, right? And, and so it's not, it's not rich. It's not like being, making a million dollars a year. No, no. And, and that bracket, why we were so excited about that one is that, you know, one hundred and forty dollars to $300,000 
is where I would say 75% of, you know, our successful business owners clients fall into. Yeah. You know, we're not talking about people that are having 800, a million dollars in, you know, AGI. It's just not very common. Um, and so that's kind of the area, the sweet spot that we were really worried about. And we really kind of wanted to go down through and say, Hey, we heard a lot of talk about this. There's a lot of numbers being thrown around. Let's really see how it's affecting, you know, small business owners. I love it. Jerry's going to make an impact on you. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, well, I want to go back to that rich statement and kind of think from the employee's term, because I think uh, so many times our employees think that, um, we're rich, you know, you're, you've got a shop that's doing a million dollars and they think you're a millionaire. So the more transparent we can be with those numbers, uh, you know, it, it benefits everybody. I, I, I love to really be in my shop. I'm transparent with the majority of the numbers and it gets everybody uh, kind of fighting for that common goal. Guys, Jerry brings up such a great point. Is Would you guys ever encourage your clients to share the P&L with their people? Yeah, we, we encourage our clients to share uh, the PRL because more often than not, uh, at least a strong portion of the PRL, the things that they can definitely control, you know, involved with the sales, the cost of goods, uh, some of the expenses, uh, you know, as a business owner, some stuff you might not want to share, but overall, you got to share a decent amount with them because they're the key that's going to help you make more money. And the more you get your PRL, more in line with your POS, that also helps along the way because most uh, team members believe the numbers of the POS. So if we could get the POS showing the proper percentages and stuff like that, that will definitely help uh, the, the, the team members help improve your business as well. So getting them to believe the, P, the POS, showing them part of the PRL, absolutely def definitely helps. Can I jump in real quick there? I got. I got. I, I. I heard you say P R L, and I've known you read for a long time. It's P or L, right? It's profit or loss. It's not profit and loss. Yeah, I know. And the other and, and, thing you mentioned, huge point, was just briefly making sure your sales system, whatever your POS is, whatever your management system is, matches what your profit and loss statement says. You know. Sometimes people are looking at that, uh, you know, that, that uh, business summary or the, the report from their management system, and the numbers aren't accurate. You know, it's so funny. I'm going to stand corrected, guys. Thank you so much because I'm, I'm listening to, uh, to Reed say PRL, PRL, and I'm thinking, okay, he knows what he's saying. I don't. And I, <laughs> my whole life, I've said P&L, P&L, my whole life, you know, been on my own businesses, the whole thing, I've had a P and L and, and so Jerry, just like you, I stand corrected. You're right. It's profit or loss. It's not profit and loss. Wow. Yeah. And so just like Jerry was alluding to uh, a lot of times, kind of that perception of your employees thinking that you're making all this money. Yeah. Once you start opening their eyes to the financial side of things, you can see how quickly, you know, even that a thousand dollar repair ticket goes away to not a whole lot be left afterwards. Um, you know, especially if you're, point of sale is set up incorrectly. You know, you're setting goals for your employees to hit a certain target and they're saying, boss, we're making 85%, you know, gross profit margin on this job. Everyone knows that's not accurate, but when they're looking at it, all the stuff that's in their face, all of the tools that they're using, it's right according to them. So, you know, once we start getting these two systems matching and everyone on the same page, you say, hey, you know what, that same thousand dollar job that you think I'm making $850, you know, I'm walking away with 400 maybe $500. Then I still have to pay for everything else you see around here. I think that buy-in kind of shows some of the employees of like, hey, you know what, there's a little bit more to it than just paying for your parts vendors and moving on. You know, that's the, probably the biggest, most impactful thing we could teach our people. You know, that the, we have to pay bills out of gross margin, gross profit, whatever, whatever words we want to use. And, and you're right, at the end of the day, God bless the shop owner for making 20%. But, you know, then there's the other story. What does he do with that 20%? I mean, you know, he's investing in the business. He's offering raises. I mean, the, the, you know, you still then pull, you have to pull things from that bottom line. And yeah, I think, I think there's, a, there's a romance from a lot of people saying, wow, I want to go into business. This is so cool. And uh, I could be rich. <clears throat> One of the, the tax rates, and, and we talked about, oh, 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jerry. No, I was going to just briefly say one of the uh, while while uh, Carm finishes coughing there. One of the uh, one of the things that that I often sh I, uh, I I I share with my team members because they don't understand it, and I've done this in front of a, a live audience many times. I you know I take a, a dollar bill and they don't understand. They think every single dollar bill that comes in the door goes directly in your pocket. And they don't realize the, ex, you know, the expenses and how little of that the shop owner keeps. And I know it's probably a crime, right, to rip that dollar bill, but a big portion of it goes to the parts store. We got to mm -hmm. pay for the parts. Big portion of it goes to you guys. I got to pay your salary. You know, 25% of that's going towards my expenses and so forth. And what's left is this little corner, you know, and it's not a whole lot. And uh, the more you can make your, your folks understand how important that profitability is, uh, we're all on the same team working for the common goal. Guys, I want to get back to you, but I have to, I have to bookend what Jerry just said. I did a seminar just like that myself, Jerry, but I, did, I used $100. Oh, I could never do that. No, 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 Jerry. No, here's what I did. I, put, I took $100 in cash in $1 bills, and I, put, and I, and I divided the money up into cost of goods, into payroll, into benefits, and, and there was envelopes. And the envelopes were attached underneath the seats in the first row. Wow. So when I started to get into the financial piece, I asked any, everyone to get up and look under their seats, and everybody in the front row had an envelope, which was the, if you come to CARM's seminars, and, then, and you sat in the first row, then there's a benefit. We started the P&L up top, you know, of course, that, that fictitious, there's $100 sitting out in the audience, and that's the sale, and we kept breaking it down, and our cost of goods was the biggest amount in the envelope, and that person, we said, you know, you're going to go to the bar tonight and, you know, buy drinks for all of us, and, you know, that's not my money, and my money, I think there were $4 in the net profit envelope. And then we talked about where, where, what, what do you do with that money? And so there's this person sitting here with the least amount, and that was the NP or the net profit envelope. So I love it. I think it's a great way even for a shop owner to get his people together and, and, and flow his P&L out into, if you will, plates, buckets, accounts, envelopes. You know, and, and, I, and I'm saying this because we're talking about accounting and profit here today, which is so cool. Maybe somebody will pick up on that and do it. I typically use it as a funnel. And you look at things as a funnel and the, the rest of what money drops down to the owner. And if we could widen the funnel, improve maybe our gross profit, a little more drops down to the owner's pocket along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I know I, I was going to just add, so many people think the, the number side or the financial side is boring. You know, you're not a numbers person, but I think the uh, SBA says something on their websites like seven out of 10 small businesses fail in the first five years. And why is that? You know, I say financial incompetence, you know, another way of, a better way of saying that is they just plain run out of money, right? So... Uh, you know, the more you can share that with and get you as a business owner, as a shop owner, you've got a, a duty to your people. <laughs> a lot of people are counting on you. Uh, you need to understand a little bit of the financial numbers. Got it. Great. By the way, Jerry, you were you wanted to talk about entertainment deductions. Guys, talk to me about entertainment. I'm going to I'm going to take my customers out to the ball game. Can I deduct that? Well, you could take them out to the ball game and have a good time, but you cannot deduct it anymore. No clubs, no ball games, no fun stuff like that uh, is a allowable deduction. In fact, if you use QuickBooks for your uh, accounting, you could might as well delete the thing that says entertainment because all entertainment is gone. Still could deduct meals, 50% of those, possibly 100% for certain items. But entertainment, uh, again, just as Hunt talked about the abuse that individuals did under employee business rate related expenses, big businesses uh, like Coca-Cola, IBM, you see them with all their suites at sporting events, and we're taking advantage of that, and now are all gone. So you mean, all that entertainment is gone. So you mean to tell me, and let's, let's take Coca-Cola, for example, they're sponsoring a golf outing, and they're going to spend a million bucks on suites and, and, and all this really cool stuff. It's on the P&L, but they cannot use it as a deduction? 
Correct. So no longer, but in the past, what we were doing as taxpayers, we were actually subsidizing all of them because they were able to deduct that stuff in the past. So, you know, when Coca-Cola had private, you know, events where all the executives could go play golf, or maybe they rented out a skybox at the Super Bowl, you know, we were covering that cost as taxpayers. And so the entertainment side of things, you know, we don't see a ton of entertainment expense for small businesses, shop owners that we work with. Um, you know, some of them do have it, you know, where they maybe have season tickets and stuff like that. Um, I wouldn't say it's a huge bang for, you know, small business owners. Um, it's really, you know, to try and curtail some of these, you know, multi-million dollar corporations that are just, you know, essentially going out and having fun on, on our expense. One thing, go ahead, Jerry. I'm sorry. One thing I would add to that though, is so many times as a small business owner, we have that it's called a chart of accounts and QuickBooks and whether QuickBooks provides you with that, or you've had it for years, there's an entertainment account and people may just drop things in there. Uh, you know, potentially meetings, maybe you're uh, having a meeting on site with your staff and you're bringing in lunch and things like that. Reed mentioned something really important and it's a writer down there. If you have entertainment as a category in your chart of accounts, strike it from that. Find some place to put it. Yeah, and to the point, if I was going to have a 60th anniversary open house for, you know, for the community, my customers, it's, it's an allowable deduction as long as it doesn't say entertainment. Correct. Correct. And, and that's one of the big things is that if the IRS comes and they looks at your financials, you know, the standard verbiage is meals and entertainment. Where in the past we were okay with that because both of those were 50% deductible. But if the IRS looks and they see that word entertainment on anything, they're going to say, we can't prove what it is. We're going to throw all of that out. So that verbiage just needs to be completely off of your finances. Okay, guys, um, I'm going to hold an offsite meeting for my team. We're going to we're, we're introducing a brand new culture inside the business, and we want this to be done right. So we're going to take a weekend at a at a resort. Um, is that meeting expense? Tell me where I would put that. That would be true. That would be a meeting expense. Still, that's not entertainment. That's not like you going to a, a show or a sporting event or going to a country club and going golfing, okay? So those are the things that they decided they want to kibosh. Got you it. having meetings with your team members or you having a holiday party uh, or a summer cookout, you still get all those. That's not a problem with that at all. Okay. It's, if you decide to go uh, to a sporting event or something that you quote unquote are going to have fun and entertained and be watching. The no fun rule. If you're having fun, it's probably not deductible anymore. The no fun rule. I love that. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's it, simple it, enough to remember. Dang. And again, it doesn't help. It doesn't usually affect much of our small businesses. Definitely, this is going after the Coca Colas, the IBMs, the Exxons. Uh, and what this means for them is they're going to pay and end up paying 21% taxes on this money that they can no longer deduct, even though they're still probably going to be spending it. Well, I, I love what you said that we're, we were funding it. I mean, if if those if those dollars were coming into our tax base coffers, then taxes had to go up for everybody to in order to pay for our government. Exactly. Well, um, I love this. Uh, listen, I, I want to move into uh, the, the the book that uh, Jerry would love to talk about for a few minutes, guys. And and please stay and and, and join in this conversation. Is there anything else that cre creams up to the top in the new tax law that we need to know about or talk about? Covered the the big hits with the the lower rates uh, and all. Just giving you examples. Our clients are increasing their taxable income and their tax burden is going down. So I will tell you this, if you found tax returns, get your accountant to compare last year to this year to show the changes, you're gonna find, even if your income went up and your taxes went up, it didn't go up the same way. It went like this way, okay? So it went down uh, along the way. So it's gonna be, you, you'll be very excited when you get your taxes done this year. For a change, I don't get to be the Grinch and I get to be Santa Claus giving the good information here. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Excellent. Jerry, you talked to me about uh, the book Profit First from Mike McCollowitz. Yeah, literally, literally changed my life. Um, probably 
three, four years ago. I don't know when the book came out, but you know, <clears throat> most uh, most business owners take a look at. <laughs> I got my copy too. It's a little bit of a different version, but uh, again, what a what a great book. Uh, I encourage I'm reading this to right now. Uh, I can't put it down. Yeah, and and basically, you know, the the premise of the book is, um, you know, let's face it. If you're if you want to lose weight. Uh, one of the key fundamental things you can do is get a smaller plate. <laughs> I know, and I'm sure many of our listeners know, you know, if I go to a buffet and they have those giant <laughs> plates, we end up eating too much, right? We eat everything that's in there. And consequently, it's the same thing uh, in business. You know, you have your bank account, which is kind of a big plate. And, uh, you know, you pretty much spend everything that's in it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's crazy how that works. You know, the, the more we do in sales, it seems like the more we spend. And a lot of times, uh, maybe there's an accountant's term for that. Uh, Reader Hunt, you would share with me. But, you know, we, we, we run the business by our bank balance. And you say, well, you know, there's $30,000 left in the bank. You know, I'm doing just fine. But that $30,000 isn't all yours. Uncle Sam wants a piece of that. You know, uh, the parts guy wants a piece of that. You got to pay your parts bill, your employees. You got rent. If you really knew what small percentage of that bank account was yours, uh, you'd probably have some sleepless nights over it. Let's, uh, let's talk about the concept of, of how to fix that in a sec. I want to say Jasper has over 2,000 associates in three manufacturing facilities two distribution centers and 45 branch offices all across the country. And they're all working to produce, transport, and deliver to you the perfect product. And that's what they do best. Keep customers happy so you can. Thanks, Jasper, for bringing the Town Hall Academy to the automotive aftermarket. And did you know that 2,200 shops get an average of 8 to 12 new customer calls from RepairPal every month? There are no long-term contracts with RepairPal and referrals from partners like CarMax and USAA add even more value. Thanks, guys, for bringing this uh, here. Uh, the thing I loved about the book is uh, that you need to have all these different accounts open. And part of the concept, Jerry, was when the revenue came in, you immediately started to move your money into those holding accounts, the uncle, your Uncle Sam account. And at the end of the day, then you have an operating account. And here's the premise of the book, guys, that I loved so much, is if you can't pay bills with the operating account, then you got a problem because you've already allocated the money that needs to, that is guaranteed. I mean, you, 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 there, there needs to be a profit account. There needs to be a, an owner account. There needs to be a tax account. And there's some other accounts. And in concept, we were always wondering when we ran out of money, what, you know, what did we do wrong? Oh my God. Well, let's go out and push revenue, 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 revenue comes in. There's money in the bank and we have this vicious cycle. And that's the part I love about the book. If, if you can't pay bills out of the operating account, then you have a problem in the expense side and or the sales side or in the gross margin side, but you're not stealing from Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, boy, how nice would it be at the end of the year to know come April 15th that you already have all your tax money set aside. And that's one of the great things about the book. So uh, I don't want to steal all the thunder from the book, but you'd mentioned, Carmen, breaks it into small different accounts. So you have that main income account where all your customer money flows into, and then you're dispersing it to other accounts. And the, the title of the book, Profit First, so you want to pay yourself first. So you set that money aside in your profit account, and then you've got to pay your expenses. Well, next comes Uncle Sam, because he's our business partner. So you have to pay Uncle Sam, and then you've got your expense account. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, that expense account usually ends up being that small account, you know, and you have to be able to make your bills work with that. And it takes some discipline to be able to do it. But uh, if you can do it, it will set you free financially. I, um, I have a goal to have Mike on my show. Yeah. I... And uh, so I'm talking about this in my coaching that uh, I'm in a, I'm in a mastermind coaching group and every Monday we get together and I said, hey, I'm reading this book, and two of the members in my group know Mike. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm not ready for the introduction, but I'm going to get one. And hopefully he, he says yes and comes on. I know he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a busy guy. Um, <clears throat> while this was great, I, I really think not only did we open the eyes of the new tax law, but we went even deeper. 
And, you know, I have to thank Reed uh, Mella's financial therapist. And yeah, I, I can see how you are and would be. And a partner at Par, Par Mellis and Associates, along with Hunt Demarest CPA at Par Mellis. Uh, obviously, they're in the same picture together. <laughs> Beautiful woodwork there. I love that. Thank they're in you. Mount Airy, Maryland. And that's what's interesting, Jerry. You're in Cleveland and they're in Maryland, and yet they're your accountants. Yeah, me, Reed and I met uh, many years ago at a conference and uh, uh, he's, their, their firm, not a commercial for them, but their firm kind of specializes in auto repair. So it was, uh, again, finding that person that can really uh, help me with some financial advice instead of just sending me the tax, uh, tax yeah. bill at the end of the year. I mean, I think that's a, that's a profound thought. Uh, we don't, you don't necessarily have to have an accountant in the same, in the same town or the same community. I, I, I believe in that great to see face to face every once in a while but with our new technology today like what we're doing i mean this is as good as face to face as you could possibly get yeah, yeah. one of the things one of the things that we hear a lot of times from new clients too is you know we might have a client in washington state and they say you know what you guys are easier to get a hold of than my person that's down the street you know because a lot of times the only way that they're able to get a hold of their accountant was to physically walk in their office um, but for us you know since we are doing everything virtual communication is huge for us. You'll always be able to call, email, you know, text, whatever it might be, because we know that that's our strength. You know, we're not selling a product, we're selling our knowledge and our advice. Um, and if you're not getting that out of your accountant right now, then you need to make a switch because, you know, that's what we're here to do. You know, we're not here to serve ourselves, we're here to, you know, help our customers answer questions, you know, help them grow and then help them hopefully grow and keep more of that money in their pocket. So don't be afraid of a virtual relationship, right, Jerry? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's worked. It's worked for me. Uh, and uh, again, you know, really get somebody that knows what they're doing. Create that power team. Make sure you got that banker, that attorney, and uh, for our conversation today, a strong accountant that can really help guide you with some of that stuff. Well, thank you to Jerry Frank, shop owner and business coach at Repair Shop Coach, um, Cleveland. How long you been in business, Jerry? A oh, long time, 35 years. I mm. kind of mentioned in my in my notes when I started in the business, there was uh, full service. Gas was about 70 cents a gallon, and we gave Eagle stamps. <laughs> so a long time. <laughs> oh my, those were the days. Yeah, it, it's it's great to see some of the some of the bios of the people that I've had on the show, and they talk about you. Know, yeah, I pump gas back when it was the biggest thing and most important thing to do. I washed windshields and I checked oil and even air pressure. Yeah, well, all time, times have changed. What's that? And now here we're having relationships over, over, over the internet and uh, well, online. Hey, thanks, guys, so much. I appreciate it. I thought this was, uh, you know, I, I always sit down and I wonder where the show is going to go. But you guys really made a difference and you had an impact on this. And thanks for being here. Now, all I want to say to everyone is it's the 100th week of the Town Hall Academy next Friday. You know, that, that middle day here in the, in the long holiday two weeks. And uh, we're going to talk about how we can raise our industry and our aftermarket by becoming level five leaders. And the idea for the show came from, the, from my audience. Uh, and if we, it was like this. If we can all take up a step, how could the aftermarket grow? How could it be better? How can we improve our image? We have to improve ourselves. And that's what we're going to talk about. Nine different tips on how to become a better level five leader and grow the aftermarket. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate it. The impact of the new tax law on the service professional here on week 99.